on? That's you. How you doing? Hey, it's you. It's me. It's him. We're recording on both. It's us. It's all of us. In your face. Welcome. You thought you thought this was just a cool graphic. Nope. This is money that I spent. <laughs> I don't even know if it's now. I realize it's, it it's might not, not even in be frame. in frame. It's definitely not in frame. Definitely not in frame. Well, it's a cool <laughs> picture that I got in my room, which is where you are right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, welcome to uh, welcome to the Rap Beers. How you doing? How you doing, Raj? I'm doing good. How you doing? I'm all right. It's been a uh, it's been it's been a nice audio journey for our listeners. So we uh, yeah, thank you to all who have listened and subscribed and said nice things and uh, just text send texts on texts on texts about it. Yes, and liked and liked and commented and inspired and told us to keep going. We really appreciate you. Yep. Don't be afraid to share too. Please Anywho. tell your friends to listen to us because that's how this works. That's exactly why we're doing it. Yeah. So welcome we're back. Not like the kid in wet, hot American summer who just like talks into a microphone all summer when it's just not plugged <laughs> yeah. in at all. He <laughs> hasn't showered for three months. Yeah. He's just talking into a radio that no one is listening to. Oh I man. Think that is- yeah. We, we don't want to be him. We <laughs> no, see- we don't want to be him. Yeah. We see we get, we get some, uh, some downloads, you know, it's, yeah. it's, 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 a, it's a war of attrition guy. So we yeah. appreciate it is what we're getting at. Yeah. And, uh, today we're here to talk to you about, um, well, we're actually going to talk about a show that we talked about in the last episode. Uh, that we are still staying up with, uh, which is The Last of Us and mm-hmm. its most recent episode, which we thought deserved a podcast uh, episode of its own. And I would agree with that. And uh, even though we are going to mainly talk about that in terms of a piece of content, uh, correct? Yeah. we also have not uh, done an episode since the uh, Academy Award nominations were released. That's true. So, yeah. So, uh, we- you know, we definitely... Wanted to talk into that, even though there's still plenty of movies that uh, we both have not seen, which have been highly nominated or talked about nomination wise. Yeah, the one movie I honestly have not seen that I really want to that's up for a lot of nominations is Tar. And I I, I will watch Tar yeah, again. Yeah. yeah, you said that. And I believe you. I just also know like it has a lot of mixed reviews. I feel like some people were like it was boring as shit. And then some people were like, Oh, it was actually really, really good. Yeah. I don't think you will find it boring. Okay. Um, I'm curious to know what you think about Lydia Tarr as a character. Okay. Yeah. Cause it's Kate, Kate Blanchett playing a like music orchestra. Like she's a conductor. conductor yeah. Okay. She's like, she's basically like the biggest conductor in the world. She's like one of the most influential, like artistically achieved people. At the height, height, height of her fame and power. Okay. And uh, you watch her uh, get ready for a concert that she's doing, which is very oh, big. Oh, okay. So it's like her preparation for a, a performance or a concert. Yes, she's, she's, do- yeah, she's okay. doing a concert, and uh, it also, obviously, that encompasses things that are happening in her personal life and how those things blend and how they affect one another. Gotcha. Um. Yeah, I think I've said it before uh, when we talked about when the SAG nominations came out, but Kate Blanchett is fantastic in this film. She's it's one of her best performances, and uh, yeah, I think it's also just filmed very, very well. It's uh, it's written very well. Um, yeah, yeah, it's just a very, very well constructed top to bottom uh, movie. So yeah, I yeah. think you'll I think you'll be happy that you've seen it. I mean, I think Scorsese gave it like the biggest compliment because like all he's talking yeah. about is how he feels like cinema's dying. And, yeah. But he was like, I saw a tar and I was like, okay, cinema's in a good spot. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's kind of where I'm getting my references of people saying it's really good. It's really just Scorsese's comment about it. Um, yeah. That guy, I'll take his opinion seriously yeah. when it comes to movies. Yeah. Me too. Um, <laughs> I think he's earned it. But yeah, we're not talking about it this episode. I still no. got to watch it. So yeah, still maybe, gotta watch it. Yeah. Maybe next episode we do everywhere, everything uh, everything all, everywhere all at once yes everything everywhere all at well. once yep and tar and tar well. yeah so okay i mean those that's are our next episode those are the two big uh you know best actress nominees yeah so now you know and now you know and um yeah so what we're drinking on this episode though um, oh yeah we as if anybody it's a return was, guest yes it's a return <laughs> guest and if anybody was listening last week um we toasted to dylan's brother liam who got married uh, last weekend, congratulations, mm-hmm. Liam and Brittany again, and uh, they, or yeah, they bought us wine and multiple bottles of it, not for their wedding, but just prior to their nope, wedding. This was a Christmas gift yes, that Liam Christmas gave me gift. a bunch of bottles of wine. And uh, the beautiful thing about having a roommate is that if that is open, it's open to everybody. Everybody drinks it. So uh, yeah, so this was uh, so yeah we. Were- Last episode we recorded before they got married, yes. and now they are officially married. So, yeah. uh, cheers to Mr. and Mrs. Murphy. Cheers to the Murphys 2.0. <laughs> I 
R.I.P. to Brittany Murphy, the OG, but now the new G, <laughs> Brittany Murphy, is in town, and watch out. Yeah, she's she's uh, she's got a long life ahead of her, ladies and gentlemen. Long, healthy life. So, um, Academy Award nominations. Academy Award nominations. We're also going to talk Why about that. Pull so, those up yeah, let's, really, just, let's just talk about those really first. quickly. Um, we don't have to go into every category, even though every category should be televised. Uh, we are not going to discuss every. Yeah, we're not going to do every category. Category. Can you see that? Uh, not really, but it's fine. <laughs> I mean, I see a screen. I can't say I'm reading. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was easy to name. All right. So, yeah, we got the... Yeah, so the first one is the best picture. Let's start from the bottom. Start, start from, from the bottom. bottom now we're here. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we'll start with best sound. Okay. Um, shout out my Uncle Richie, who is a sound guy. Yeah, shout out Uncle Richie. Uh, we are definitely down to get that audio mixer off of you as well to uh, shoot our next Yeah, he's going to drive to the other side of Florida, so... Yes, to go get a mixer so that we can make movies. Um, yeah. So, best sound, because uh, it's all about the sound, too. If anybody is, like, not familiar with how a movie works, like, most of the time you don't know that you're watching a, mo- a movie because the sound and the music sounds so, like, natural. So, this is important. Very important. Very important. So, take it away, buddy. Uh, so, we got All Quiet on the Western Front, Avatar The Way of Water, The Batman, the Batman. Elvis, Top Gun Maverick. Uh, yeah. So I'm Top Gun Matt. Right? It's got to be Top Gun, right? <laughs> yeah, like maybe Batman, but probably Top Gun. Yeah. Uh, next one is best original score. We can just alternate. So I'll take this one. Uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, Babylon, Banshees of Inishirin, Everything Everywhere All at Once, and The Fablemans. Uh. Love John Williams. He's had a great career, but let's go Banshees. Go Banshees. Uh, I haven't seen Babylon. Um, I haven't seen Babylon either. That actually might win. I did hear the score it, is supposed to be very good. Yeah, I was say I can see that score being pretty pretty gnarly. Yeah, that's also the same guy who did the score for La La Land and won. So oh, okay. there you go. He's gotcha. probably going to get him. Uh, best makeup and hairstyling. Uh, All Quiet on the Western Front. The Batman. Black Panther. Wakanda Forever. Elvis. The Whale. Ooh. Ooh, the whale. Hey, now. Hey. Uh, <laughs> for makeup and hairstyle. I mean, yeah, like. I mean, for makeup, for sure. Yeah, definitely. It was a hairstyle. I'm trying to think of, was it really much? Uh, they probably, like, accentuated his, like, baldness and, like, yeah. haircut and stuff. But overall, I mean, like, having the prosthetics on him and all that stuff, like, that's, I'm sure. Yeah. They'll, they'll probably give it to Elvis, though, I would say honestly. Elvis probably will win it because that was quite uh, Bars or Boz. Whatever his last name is. Lerman. Yeah, Lerman. Yeah. Uh, Best live action, action short. short. Got a lot of friends who are probably uh, excited to see the winner of this category. Oh, yeah. <laughs> An Irish Goodbye, which just is a beautiful title. Yeah. Uh, I want to see it. Yeah. Ivalu. Uh-huh. Le Pupelli or Le Pupil. Le Pupil. Yeah. <laughs> Night Ride. <laughs> and The Red Suitcase. All right. Uh, I mean, Irish Goodbye. I'm just going off the titles now. Yeah. I think they're all made by, like, international uh, directors as well. That's cool. Yeah. Um, Best costume design. Uh, Babylon, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, Elvis, Everything Everywhere All at Once. Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris. Uh, Hey. Yeah, that would probably be Elvis again. Probably. Maybe Babylon, but uh, I'm I'm feeling Elvis. Yeah. Um, Elvis isn't going home empty-handed. It's, I'll just it's, say that. it's not. I mean, Except. it wasn't, you know, it, it was a good movie. I'm just... Yeah. I, I don't know if I would have made that movie that way. That's that's all I'm going to say. No. That's just us. Like, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, we'll stop there. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, best animated short film. Ooh, I'm excited to read uh, this one. Go. Oh. <laughs> Oh, did I read the last one? You should read the last <laughs> no, one. No, no, go okay. ahead. Yeah, you uh, did, but go I ahead. did. Okay, all right. Then you get two. Best animated <laughs> short film. The Boy, The Mole, The Fox, and The Horse. Uh, the Flying Sailor. Ice Merchants. Uh, best title of the whole Oscar season. I'm going to say it right now, and you'll agree with me. My Year of Dicks. <laughs> uh and an ostrich told me the world is fake, and I think I believe it. So I actually, so I saw the clip of when they were doing the Oscar nominations. Uh-huh. I think Riz Ahmed read with somebody, and he did this category. And when he said my year of dicks, he stopped because he just had to laugh. And like the whole <laughs> press, everybody in there started laughing. And then I stumbled upon Kamel Nanjiani's uh, 
yeah. Instagram and he was just like, hey, I have nothing to do with this movie, but I saw this short film uh, called My Year of Dicks and it's one of the best things I've seen recently. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I don't know if it's still true, but apparently they had a website called myyearofdicks.com. And uh, they were streaming it for free. I don't know if that's still true. But, oh, that's cool. Uh, I would definitely want to. I would definitely want to check that out. Yeah. And I hope it wins, just because I want there to be an Oscar that says my scratch etched in my year of dicks. Yeah, Sarah uh, Gonnet's Gonnet Stort Gonna Story. I'm not even sure. Yeah. I'm not uh, even gonna try to. Pronounce uh, we're that so name. so sorry and for Pamela, butchering that. Pamela Ribbon. Yes. Uh, so. Hopefully we pronounced your names at least remotely accurate. But we will definitely watch your movie if we can yes. find it. Yes. Uh, so and by the way. We're definitely like big fans of anybody who listens, regardless if they have an Academy Award film or not. So, yeah, um, just an honor being nominated. Yeah, that's 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 very cool. Um, okay, yeah. So, All right, best animated best feature animated film. Feature film. Uh, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. It's probably my my pick. Okay, Marcel the Shell with shoes on. Oh, shout out old school YouTube. <laughs> Puss in Boots: The Last Wish. Someone did tell me that was very good. I believe it. I believe it. Uh, the Sea Beast and Turning Red. All right. Okay. Cool stuff. Best visual effects. All Quiet on the Western Front. That's a that's a frequent frequent flyer here. Got a lot of nominations. A lot yeah. of noms. Avatar: The Way of Water. The Batman. Black Panther: Wakanda Forever. And Top Gun: Maverick. All right. Um. Best. Per- oh, excuse me. Best production design, All Quiet on the Western Front, Avatar, The Way of Water, Babylon, Elvis, The Fablemans. Uh, well, once again, I got to see Babylon. Once again, I got to see Babylon. Also got to see All Quiet on the Western Front. Yes. You haven't seen it? No. Oh. Did you watch it? No. Oh, but why are you fucking... <laughs> I'll watch it this weekend. Yep. So, Tar... Yeah, all, West, all quiet on the Western Front and uh, everything everywhere all at once. Yeah, there we go. All right, uh, best original song. Uh, we got uh, the song. I'm going to say the name of the song and the movie it's from. Uh, applause from Tell It Like a Woman. Uh, Hold My Hand from Top Gun Maverick. Lift Me Up from Black Panther: Wakanda Forever. Uh, Not to Not to from RRR. <laughs> uh, this is a life from Everything Everywhere All at Once. Good stuff. I think RRR is going to get that because they got the Golden Globe. Oh, did they? Mm-hmm. Okay. That makes, that get that makes total sense. Uh, best International Feature Film, uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, which is a German film, Argentina, 1985. Where's mm. that from? Uh, <laughs> close. Belgium. Uh, ooh, I wanted to see this. EO from Poland. Poland. Yeah. And uh, The Quiet Girl from Ireland. Hey. Very cool. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Argentina, 1985. What is that on? Is it on... Amazon? I think that is on Amazon. Okay. I'm seeing ads for it. It looks kind of fun. Yeah. EO look cool just because uh, it's a, just bat, it just follows a donkey. Oh. It literally just follows a donkey around town. And uh, Quiet Girl, obviously, I- Ireland. And uh, I saw the trailer, and like half of it is spoken in Irish, in Gaelic. Oh, which really? Is very cool. That's very cool. Mm-hmm. Super tight. Super tight. Speaking Super. Irish is tight. So tight. Uh, so we got best. Film editing. I'll go ahead and take this one. Yeah. The Banshees of Inishirin. Elvis. Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Tar. And Top Gun Maverick. Uh, fun fact. I think I may have mentioned this on a previous podcast or just to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw an interview or I saw a conversation that Joseph Kaczynski, the director of Top Gun Maverick, was having with Ryan Johnson. Okay. And he told Ryan Johnson that he gave his editor 183 hours of, uh, of footage. Oh, you told me this. You, of which movie? Top, Top Gun, Gun Maverick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it was like the multiple angles of them like flying and shit. Yeah, they yeah. had like anywhere of like anywhere in the vicinity of like 25 to 30 cameras rolling at the same time. That's just stupid. Which is just wow. bonkers. Um, oh so, yeah. I'm, I personally think that that is going to be, that should be the winner if I had to pick. Yeah. Everything uh, everywhere uh could be a close second just cuz with the jump cuts and how they did it on a like the budget for that movie wasn't that big. Right. Like it it maybe 10 million, 10 15 million? Yeah. I'm that's just me guessing, I don't know. Yeah, and and I think the cool Definitely thing, not top gun money. Yeah. The one thing about this category too, like just to speak on it real quick is anybody who's not an editor, like 
you don't really understand the nuances and tediousness that goes into like making fingers look like they're chopped off somebody's hand um in post that's all the editing um the same with you know oh, yeah. any sort of like i guess that is cool because like also like when you know if we're speaking about the same movie yeah um yeah when the person is holding something and yeah. blood is getting on it yeah when it's not yeah that's also included in this in that post, whole aspect yeah. is post stuff yeah so um it is it is quite a challenging feat and some of the stuff i really don't know how they do how they do it so it's it, it would be really cool to see anybody win in this category from all these movies listed um and i still haven't seen tar so i can only imagine how ridiculous that probably looks yeah um so yeah i also agree though with you top gun probably should win um also one of those movies i have a problem with but (laughs) as do i uh the best documentary short film yeah Best documentary yep. short film. Um, Join our Patreon. We'll tell you what movie we said. <laughs> the Elephant Whispers. Uh, Howl Out? Yeah, Howl Out, I believe. Uh, sure. Uh, how do you measure a year? I'm going to let you pronounce the international stuff. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> the Martha Mitchell Effect and Stranger at the Gate. Okay. Cool. They sound cool. Uh, best documentary feature. Best documentary feature. We have All That Breathes. Which I think is on HBO now. Okay. So add that to the list. All the Beauty and the Bloodshed, Fire of Love, A House Made of Splinters, uh, Navalny. I think, based on things that I've heard, I'm pretty sure All the Beauty and the Bloodshed is what's going to be what's going to be picked. You know what that's about? I think it's about a woman. She was like a photographer, but she was also like a strong like women's activist. Okay. So it like talked about it parallels like talking about her journey in her career, but also like, you know, stuff helping with like, I think she was very proactive in like, you know, abortion legislative and like, you know, Roe v. Wade, like getting passed in the seventies uh, okay. and stuff. So cool. uh, it's also a very timely um, documentary. Oh, so they did it like over a period of time. Uh, I mean, I think they maybe touched back on her, like when Roe v. Wade got overturned. Um, oh, okay. But I'm sure they were, I mean, I think that's just one of those crazy things with documentaries is sometimes you're filming it and something happens that you couldn't have planned for. Yeah. But then all of a sudden it becomes like integral to the movie and the right. story that you're telling. Yeah. By the way, next to nerding out on editing, I really like documentaries. So if you guys have any documentaries that you recommend us watching. Um, yeah. Please. Documentaries, honest. And Let even just on the acting side of it, like so helpful. Yeah. 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 It's so, uh, so helpful. Like gives you so much information. It shows does. you real people who like, Cause like, you know, for me, I'm trying to play someone who is like, this thing is like every fiber of their being. So right. to see people where that ev- it's every fiber of their being yeah. very helpful for me as well. Yeah. So yeah, sh- shoot us a uh, DM, uh, whatever, and let us know yeah. what, what's your what favorite documentary, uh, documentary just now that we're talking about it ever. Yeah. The jinx, the jinx. Yeah. Okay. So we are including like a limited series as well. Yes. Like multi thousand percent. Yeah. Best like documentary movie though. Um, I, you know, man, I got to say, probably uh, Alpha Blood, the the Elizabeth Holmes one. Really? I, I okay. think I think I might go with that. Yeah. Like for a movie. Okay. I really like This Place Rules, but it, I think like over like watching it and walking away like, holy shit, she really did that? And like what's really behind this person? Sure. Yeah. Like that was the documentary that did that for me. Okay. For sure. So. Respect. Yeah. I think for me. I had two that just came to mind. Mm. Um, oh my god, the first one's kind. Of, oh, so the first one that came to mind, and now I don't know how much of a documentary it is, but it came across very much like it's a documentary. Mm. Uh, it's a movie called Snow on the Bluff. Yes. Yeah. 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 The Netflix one from like 2012, uh, 2013. I th- maybe. Yeah. I yeah. think so. Um, <laughs> but, Fuck them, we ball. <laughs> yeah, dude, that movie is just in. That movie is crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. Someone dies in the movie. Yes. Which, it's very sad. Very sad. Um, um, like, one of the saddest things I've ever seen <laughs> on film is, uh, you know, a child is reacting to it, and it's very yeah. upsetting. So I would say that, because it was just so fucking hardcore. Yeah. But in uh, an, the other one that I thought of, which is very real, and actually won the Academy Award for Best Documentary, I think 
I really hope I get the name right. I think it's called Undefeated. Oh, yeah, on Netflix, the one. I think yeah, it was. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it was on Netflix. I actually did see it in theaters. Yeah, it came out like 2011. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah 2011, uh, P. Diddy was an executive yes, producer on it. Yes. It's about like a high school football team in, mm-hmm. I think, Memphis area. Yeah, Edumacation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just so, like, but dude, like, so beautiful. Yes. Like, those yes. kids, like, there was, like, one kid in particular, he was just, like, so poor, and he just, like, ripped my heart out, but he was, like, such a good kid. Yeah. Anyway. Oh, the other one, too, was uh, the Amy Winehouse documentary, Amy. Ah, I Which I think also that. won. It did win an Oscar. I think that it did win an Oscar. Yeah. That one is also great, and, uh, yeah, that's just, that's just a great one. I liked how they told that, and really... Loved Amy Winehouse even yeah. more than that. So two of those were on Netflix, and the other other four that we mentioned were on HBO. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so HBO, Netflix, what up? What's up? Um, next, best cinematography. <laughs> <laughs> All quiet on the Western Front. Uh, Bardo, mm-hmm. false chronicle of a handful of truths. Elvis, Empire of Light. Roger Deakins, and Tar. And Tar. I'm going to go ahead and just tell you right now, uh, I'm very upset <laughs> that um, Top Gun Maverick is not in this category, and I'm very upset that The Batman is not in this category. I think uh, both of those movies not only should be nominated, I think those were the two best shot uh, in the category of cinematography of- Of last year? Of last year. Huh. In, I my, saw, in my humble opinion. I saw them both in theaters. Um, I would say probably, yeah. Uh, yeah, probably. Um, probably. There's also Greg, man. like Greg Frazier is one yeah. of the best cinematographers out there. Uh, who he did the cinematography for the Batman. Yeah. But he also did uh, Foxcatcher, and uh, he did Dune. He he won for Dune, I think. Okay. Foxcatcher um, was good too. Foxcatcher was very like, good. Like how like how how they shoot it. It's, it's pretty, oh yeah, pretty, it looked pretty like chilling. A, yeah, it had a very chilling '80s like VHS tape tone yeah, to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I still, I still think about frames of that movie, and it. Fucking I'm not happy Burrell, about man. it. Yeah, <laughs> like him just looking at a field. Yes. Oh. Um. Ugh. <laughs> so unsettling. Anyway, so I whoever wins that category to me, it kind of I feel like I feel like the Academy screwed the pooch on that one. Okay, fair enough. But Roger Deakins. Listen, Roger Deakins you, is the goat. There's no disputing it. <laughs> Um, you know, if he wins, it just makes up for the other dozen times that he probably should have won and didn't. So fair enough. You know, uh, Godspeed. Godspeed, buddy. Um, all right, here we go. I'll let you yep. go ahead and read this one. Yep. So this is where the fun begins, ladies and gentlemen. The best original screenplay nominees are the Banshees of Inishirin, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, The Fablemans, Tar. Triangle of Sadness. Hmm. Which one was the one that your mom just recently watched? Was it Triangle of Sadness? Or no, To Leslie, the Amazon one. No, she just watched To Leslie, which okay. we'll get to uh, we momentarily. Will. Which one do you like? I mean, I'm rooting for Banshees. I, I, it's. I would be truly happy if either Banshees or Everything Everywhere won. Hmm. Um, the Fablemans is also very nice. Tar is just like again, it's a very impressive just piece of like. Like if I read the screenplay, I would be like it. It almost be like reading, I don't know, like a piece of Russian liter like literature where you're just like, this is a this is a behemoth. <laughs> like someone's like, dude, you read that? Like, like, damn. Yeah, like Aaron Sorkin's first draft of American President. I'm doing oh. his master class, and he said it was 385 pages. That's insane. <laughs> this is the first well, draft. actually, it's funny because uh, Tony Kushner, who's nominated with Steven Spielberg for The Fablemans, mm-hmm. apparently his original draft of Lincoln that he wrote. 550 pages. Get out of here. They originally had like a, they were going to do it like a six part series, but then they ended up doing like a three hour movie. Oh, okay. Instead. Oh, well, that, that makes sense. Yeah. That uh, I do want to see Triangle of Sadness though, because I heard it's absolutely insane. Okay. Uh, and it also won the Palm Dior at Cannes. Yeah. I was going to say, usually like the screenplays or um, like best adaptation or something, like those typically are like really like gnarly movies to watch, like really cool movies to watch. Yeah, well, yeah, it's just like, I don't know. No one, no one, I've known people who have seen it who like can't even really describe it to me. Yeah. <laughs> Cause they're just like, you kind of just have to see it to get it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'm rooting for, I'm rooting for Banshees cause we're, I'm a McDonough guy. You're a McDonough guy. Yeah, we're, we're McDonough guys over here for yeah. sure. 
Um, yeah, me, uh, me too, me too. I, I did like the Fable ones. I just saw that last week. I really oh, very liked much. It. I very much yeah. enjoyed it. One of my favorites for sure. Um, okay, best adapted screenplay. I'll take this one. And let you ride with a couple more. Uh, All Quiet on the Western Front. Really have to see this now. Glass Onion, A Knives Out Mystery, Living, Top Gun Maverick, and Women Talking. Very happy Women Talking got a got a nomination here. Me too. Uh, yeah, I would be good with. Uh, I mean, Top Gun Maverick is great. Yeah. So I'd be I'd be kind of okay with that. Um, just like with it being a sequel, it was hard to like follow up Top Gun. And then, right. like, it was really like they good. Did have to, like, the story did have to be, like, perfect. Yeah, and it was better than the first Top Gun. Not, well, yeah. It, oh, it totally. Was really good. Oh, my God. So, I so I was having this conversation with my brother. And, uh, <laughs> love you, Liam. Thanks thanks again for the wine. Congratulations. <laughs> um, just could not have been more wrong about, <laughs> he was talking about, like, I mentioned how this, because we were talking about the new Top Gun, and, like, because I had relatives in town. And uh, they were, you know, we were talking about how awesome it is. And I was like, yeah, it's better than the, like, because I had a couple of family who hadn't seen it. And I was like, oh, and it's even better than the first one. And my brother goes, all right, relax. It's not better than the first one. <laughs> I go, all right, relax. Yes, it is. He goes, um, he goes, no, it's not. I go, yeah, it is. It's a, be- it, there's an actual story in here. Like, there's actually like, it's true. Like, in the other one, it's just like, oh, we get all these cool pilots, put them in a school. And, like, that's the whole movie, where it's like, this is an actual, like, a character going through redemption and, like, making amends and blah, da, 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 da. Yeah. Uh, rising to a challenge. Yeah. Working together. His one complaint, and I'm so mad that I didn't say anything at the moment, because this is what always happens. You you realize the rebuttal, yeah. <laughs> like, two days later. His biggest complaint was he thought the whole football game scene yeah. was stupid. He just thought it was dumb and just at like the beach. Yeah, at the beach. Yeah. Like he was like, oh, you're gonna you're gonna redo the volleyball scene like with the he was like, that's stupid. No one plays football like that. Yeah. And I didn't have an answer for him, I think, because my pasta had come and I just wanted to eat and stop talking <laughs> to him. But I realized in the shower, I was like, wait a minute. You're talking about how the football game isn't real. Do you know what wasn't real in the first movie? That any of the actors were flying planes. (laughs) None of them were flying planes. They were just in a fucking thing, and they had to be like, ah, fucking, ah, goose, bam, like, do all this shit. In this movie, they're actually in the planes, and Tom Cruise is actually flying the plane. (laughs) That's him doing it. Acting is doing. He was doing. He was doing more than anybody. How he actually... I he was this. Top Gun. He was Maverick. <laughs> yeah. He is Maverick. They are the same. <laughs> he was present. Yeah, no, oh. it's... Yeah, and that's, actually, that's but true. Tying it back true. to the screenplay, I think that's actually... That's what made the movie work so well. Yeah. Is that they sh- they showed you all the things that are impossible. Or they showed you all these things and they, mentioned, they showed it as being impossible. Mm-hmm. And then they literally have the guy doing it. Yeah. To not only... And to like raise the stakes of like, not only can it be done, it was just done. You <laughs> by just an saw actor. it happen yeah. by Tom Cruise. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's fucking, it bl- that one scene blew my mind. And like knowing that it was real, it was actually Knowing that it was real, I yeah. was like, that's how you fucking raise the stakes. Yeah. Like, that's how you do it. Yeah. So, yeah, fucking Top Gun Maverick. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Women talking's great, but Top Gun Maverick. I'm sorry, Sarah Polly. <laughs> All right. Best well, supporting actress. I'm fucking go. I'm amped now, man. Holy shit. <laughs> Take a drink. Take a breath, buddy. Woo. Get a towel. All right. All right. Best supporting actress. Here we go. Now we're now we're in the nitty gritty. Now this is what the, this is what the people came here for. Best supporting actress. Uh, we got Angela Bassett for Black Panther: Wakanda Forever. Uh, Hong Chow, the whale. Very happy about that nomination. Carrie Condon, Banshees of Inna Sharon. Congrats, Carrie. Uh, and Jamie Lee Curtis and Stephanie Hsu, Everything Everywhere All at Once. Bravo. 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 To, to those two ladies. Jamie Lee Curtis with her first nomination. Stephanie Hsu, obviously her first nomination. This yep. is her first movie. Yep. Yeah, it is. And shout out to uh, Angela Bassett for, uh, or Bassett, however you pronounce it. Sorry. I'm a... Uh, Respect your queen. I I, I do. I'm, Especially once she wins. Dude, I, 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 yeah, I, I probably will be getting exiled after this fucking episode, but go Wakanda. Moving on. Moving on. <laughs> Best supporting actor. 
Uh, we got Brendan Gleason for the Banshees of Inner Sharon. Brian Tyree Henry for hey. Causeway. Very excited about that. So excited. Uh, Judd Hirsch for the Fablemans. All right. <laughs> uh, sorry, Paul Dano. Wow. Uh, it stings. Uh, Barry <laughs> Keegan for Banshees of Inner Sharon. Uh, very cool story about him, by the way. I just found out recently. Apparently, he was in a bunch of foster homes and uh, was and uh, got his first acting gig that he saw on like a fucking poster somewhere in Ireland that he passed oh, by. Oh, wow. And now he's got a fucking Oscar nomination. Hell yeah. So congrats, Barry. Good job, Barry. And uh, one of the love stories of this campaign season, Kihi Kwan, Everything Everywhere All at Once, the man who's probably going to win it. Uh, yeah. And uh, again, deservedly so, because everybody, lo- everybody loves Waymond. Yeah, everybody loves Wayman. And the crazy part was, like... I'm your husband from another dimension. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, so that is the funniest line of the entire movie. Yeah, uh, well, also I, just the whole their whole exchange. It's yeah. just like, go away, very busy today. Yes. No, 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 I'm your husband from another dimension. From another dimension. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. So that's, yeah, that's... And then he beats the fuck out of people with a fanny pack? Yes. Awesome. Just, an incredible movie. Check it out if you haven't seen it. Best um, lead actress. Lead actress. Ooh. I'm going to let you handle these, man. You're an actor. All right. Well, this kind of is also the, the hot button uh, category, I would say, oh, yeah. of, of this award season. So yeah. we got Kate Blanchett for Tar. Not surprising. Ana de Armas for Blonde. Hold on. <laughs> Andrea Riseborough <laughs> to Leslie. Hold Big on. Hold on. <laughs> Uh, Michelle Williams, The Fablemans, awesome. Straight. And Michelle Yeoh, Everything Everywhere All at Once, Definitely. very, very awesome. She was a mate. Uh, again, I've talked ad nauseum about her performance in this yeah. movie. If she won, I would just be through the roof. Now, for those who don't know, <laughs> um, Andrea Riseborough, fine actor. She did this movie to Leslie. This movie made twenty-seven. Mo- made $27,000 yeah. in the box office. And I think was shot within 19 days, mm. an incredibly short amount of time. Yeah. So the, the, what do those two things mean? It means there is no money attached to this movie right. in terms of making it, in terms of distributing it, in terms of how much profit it made. There's just no money. Right. And uh, people don't really know that uh, in order to campaign for these things, you know, with press and all these things, costs a lot of money. A lot. Yeah. And there was just no money for this movie to have any sort of, uh, you know, campaigning. And so what I don't know this for fact, but I would be under the impression that maybe Miss Riseborough's agency, which is CAA, the biggest agency in the world, Mm -hmm. probably reached out to some of their clients like, hey, here's this movie. If you feel so inclined as to say something nice about it, please go right ahead. Do I know this as fact? I do not, (laughs) but rarely do you ever see celebrities such as Gwyneth Paltrow, Edward Norton, even Kate Blanchett in an acceptance speech single like singled out Andrea Riseborough. Now, Hmm. all of this is to say. Number one, I've not seen this movie. This was so like they would like mention her name in a speech before the movie. Gwyneth Paltrow posted, uh, I guess, like the poster of this movie and just basically and just gave Andrew Riseborough all of the praises saying mm. how amazing it is. When was this? I don't know. Yeah, okay. It started. It's been within the last two months. It happened like while voting was happening. OK, that um, is interesting. It is interesting. OK, now here's what I will say. Number one, I have not seen this film, but my mother just saw this film. She did a couple of days ago. Mm-hmm. And she said to me, Dylan, if you watch this movie. And you forget about all of that stuff and you just watch the movie and you just watch her performance. You not only think that she deserves to be nominated, but that she deserves to win. Mm. I talked to my mom about this movie and she was still like choking up talking about it. Yeah. So like everything under the sun is saying that this woman gave one of the best performances of the year and therefore should be praised. Correct. Um, and again, it's not her fault how these, it's not your fault. You did an amazing job and you got nominated. Right. Uh, it just sucks for people like, you know, Danielle Deadweiler, who was the lead until who was Mm -hmm. getting nominations, who just got a SAG nomination. Anybody from women talking. Nobody from women talking. Yeah. Um, but I will say I'll single out Daniel Deadweiler specifically because I think it just fucking sucks that 
and I talked about, I even mentioned this with my mom. She was like, I just don't think I can watch that movie. Mm -hmm. And I was like, but, but yeah, that's what a lot of people probably said. They probably said, I can't watch this movie. And because of that, they missed watching an incredible performance and watching an incredible movie. Right. Um, I don't want to watch leaving Las Vegas because I don't want to see a man drink himself to death. Right. Yeah. Um, but also too, like the film, like everybody involved with that also knew that that would be people's mindsets. Yeah. And so they were like, yeah, we know that. Like, it's not going to be the whole movie that you have to right. stare at, but you will have to see it because yeah. that's a part of the story. That's, that's, yeah, that's part of it. Yeah. So anyway, it kind of sucks that Daniel Deadweiler, you know, I'm sorry she didn't get nominated. Um, I know Viola Davis kind of maybe got screwed over too, mm. uh, for one reason or another. Um, on a day armist though, what, is, what were your... I haven't seen the movie. I haven't seen it either. Again, I will go to my mom where she said she did not like the movie, but she thought she thought she did. She a great thought job. her performance yeah. was incredible. Yeah, so. she did say that countless times when I saw her that she thought Blonde was not necessarily the best movie, but Anna de Armas did a great job. So yeah. Well, also, it's that. not going to sit. It's never going to sit right with an Irish Catholic if uh, you portray JFK and RFK in not the best lights. So that's all I'll say about that. True. All um, right. Best lead actor. Best lead actor. Here we go. So we got Austin Butler for Elvis. Uh, we got Colin Farrell for the Banshees of Inna Sharon. Mm-hmm. Our King Brendan Fraser <laughs> for the Whale. Our King. Now these two were very surprising. Uh, one of which, given our last episode, I'm still quite happy about. It's Paul Mescal for After Sun. I, I respect it. Don't know if I agree with it, but I respect it. Yeah, I respect it. Um, and yes, even though I was singing his praises, I will say. I think if the movie was to be nominated, I think Charlotte Wells should have gotten a nomination either for the screenplay or direction. Okay. I feel like this was their way of being like, hey, we're acknowledging this movie with this nomination. And it is what it is. But anyway, not his fault. Still did a great job. Right. Right. And then last but not least, we have Bill Nighy for Living. Okay. Um, which I definitely want to see. I still want to. Uh, it's based on a Kurosawa movie called Akiru. Okay. Which I've heard is excellent, so I want to watch that. Yes. And then watch Living. Okay. Yeah, I'm down for that. Always down for a game yeah. show. Um, best director, Mr. Martin McDonough for The Banshees of Anna Sharon. Daniel Kwan and Daniel Sh- Scheinert for Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Steven Spielberg, The Fablemans, Todd Field, Tar, and Ruben Ostland for Triangle of Sadness. Uh, Pretty I solid. Mean, very Slight solid. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and say uh, I am prop. They're probably going to give it to Spielberg. I think so too. And I don't really, I don't mind it at all. I, I mean, yeah, he's the greatest filmmaker. So this is actually real quick. I will say this about the Fablemans, um, and it speaks to why I think he should win and probably will will win. Um, the Fablemans, if you watch, if you don't know anything about what the movie is, right? Just like Munich, right? Or any other Steven Spielberg movie. Yeah. If you go into it and you don't know what it's about, or you do know what it's about, but you're like, okay, uh, for example, Lincoln. Like, I'm going to see this movie about Abraham Lincoln. How can it be entertaining? Mm-hmm. Steven Spielberg, and this is what the Fablemans really kind of showed me about him and why he's such a great. Uh, director Steven Spielberg has an amazing ability to make an audience relate to the emotion he, that he's conveying on screen. Yes. Meaning he has like when I'm shooting wedding films, for example, he knows specifically what type of shot or what type of blocking or what type of just, tone of or or what to say to an actor or where to place the camera or how to move the camera he knows one little thing that will make each of his films this masterpiece of just relatability like where you can fall into line with I've been there or I understand or whatever and I think there is no better example of that than the Fablemans I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I um, mean, how, yeah. yeah, how he, yeah, how he sets up a shot, how he sets up a scene is nothing short of masterful. Um, and also, like, I think I saw all of these. I haven't seen Triangle of Sadness, 
So the other four movies I've seen in theaters. I saw all four of these movies in theaters. Or the other four movies in theaters. Not one of them. Uh, I was very entertained by all of them. I was very... In, yeah. I, I, had, I was fully invested in everything. But when I watched The Fablemans, there was something about it that physically drew me to the screen. Correct. Like, I, tr- I felt propelled out of my body that drew me towards what was happening on screen. Yes. And no other, honestly, no other film this year did that. Correct. It's it's a very one of a kind, like movie going experience when you watch a Steven Spielberg movie where it's going to make you feel. He taps into this, yeah, phys, like a physical connection with what you're watching. He taps into the sense of wonder. Yes, that nobody else does. Yes, and, and he it, can do it whether it's stuff that's out of this world or stuff that's very much of this world. Totally, yeah. yeah, and like also so bold and daring, yeah, with that whole movie to to be what it was, and then the movie ends on a laugh, yes, <laughs> like it ends on a joke, yeah, like that is such like for him to be still taking risks like yeah. that is so cool, yeah, and like that's why he's the best, yes, that's why he's the best that's ever done it, yeah, and we will wrap it up, uh, the Oscar nominations with. The best picture. We got a long one, man. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So we got All Quiet on the Western Front. Let you say that one. Uh, Avatar The Way of Water. The Banshees of Inisherin. Elvis. Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. The Fablemans. Tar. <laughs> Top Gun Maverick. Triangle of Sadness. And Women Talking. Those are your 2022 Oscar nominations. Those are your Oscar nominations. Best Picture Man, I I got to say my favorite of all of those, and this is tough, everything, everywhere, all at once. Yeah. That's mine too. That was the most fun movie I have seen in a while. Like, so I was on a plane and was like, laughing like a barbarian because it was so funny but just fresh yeah like fresh like sci-fi just let's go nuts type of movie yeah and I mean I think that's so yes I completely I agree with all of that um the only other film that I saw that like superseded everything everywhere for me because everything everywhere was my favorite movie of the year. And, but then I saw Top Gun Maverick (laughs) and I was like, this movie just fucking rocks. But (laughs) I think Top Gun Maverick wasn't made to win Oscars. Top Gun Maverick was made to bring people back to the movie theaters. Yes. Which I think it did. Okay. So in that, in that sense, I think Top Gun Maverick has already won. And for that, I think everything everywhere should win because everything everywhere is what makes people want to make movies. Yes. Yeah, 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 like, yeah, yeah. If I saw yeah. this movie when I was, I don't know, fucking 10 years old. Yeah. I'd be 14's like. 14's a good age. 14's a good age because you could see it's because it is an R-rated movie. Yeah. Um, if I saw this movie at 14, I would be like, all right, I'm, I'm getting a camera. I'm going to make a movie with my friends this weekend. I'm going to go to film school. I'm going to, yeah. What did the Daniels do? Where did they go? Like, like I'm like, I would be fully, I would become the Daniels 2.0. Yes. Um, so I think because of that, and again, like they did stuff, they made me cry at rocks having a conversation. (laughs) I don't know how that's possible. Not cry. I cried at The Last of Us. At The Rocks part, I teared up. And then the end of Everything Everywhere, I was crying. I forgot about The Rocks part. That's you forgot how, about the, No, yeah. like, that's how, like, that's how much cool shit was in the movie. So, The Rocks part was, like, just, I mean, dude, go What's watch there, it. Go, just watch, go it. watch it. Just go watch it. Just go watch it. If you've seen it, go watch it again, because I am. Yeah, because like, we're going to watch it again, yeah. and then we're going to talk about it at length. At, yeah. Because there are things obviously I don't remember, but the rocks was that that was a nice touch, man. That oh. was that was that was that was top notch. And just the sound of wind. Yeah, just oh. wind. Fantastic. So real quick, real quick. Uh, 
The Last of Us, episode three. The Last of Us, episode three. Um, I'm going to go out and just say it. One of the best episodes of television I have ever seen. I think one of the most powerful episodes of television, for sure. Yeah. 100%. Um, I was apps. So I was really trying, and I, and I didn't, except I kind of did. So, all right. So, spoiler warning for anyone who's not seen the episode, uh, the new episode of Last of Us. This is your warning. So I was at work. And I work with a bunch of fucking nerds, like myself. Right. A lot of people watch the show. And so I overheard someone say, I wish he didn't kill himself. And I just knew that they were talking about The Last of Us. I, just, oh, okay. I didn't, I, but I just knew it because yeah. I knew the manager, it's a friend of mine. Yeah. I knew that's, that's what they were talking about. So I was like, oh, dude, I fuck. I got to see this episode. So I was going to try to see it Monday, but then the Knicks decided to go into overtime with the <laughs> Lakers and fucking lose because they're the fucking Knicks. They um, did. Go uh, Lakers. Oh, actually, no, that was Tuesday night. I'm sorry, because we did end up still watching The Last of Us. I was going to watch To Leslie and then The Last of Us. Oh, okay. Okay. Knicks. Anyway, so Monday I didn't watch it. Tuesday, uh, me and Roger watched it. And I had completely, but this is how good the episode was. I completely forgot because I didn't know the context. I just knew kills himself. Right, right, right. So I didn't know who they were talking about. But then I was so invested in the episode that I completely forgot about it. Yeah. Which is just a testament to how well it was written. Right. uh, And how just incredible it was told. And I mean, my God, Nick Offerman and Murray Bartlett. Like those guys, I don't know what category they need to go into to win Emmy Awards. Yeah. But they both should be given everyone who did anything with that episode should be given an Emmy Award just just for that episode alone. I think the episode itself probably will win um an Emmy because like if they're yeah. campaigning for stuff with the Emmys, that's the episode that they Yeah. That well they should- like individual episodes can win. Right. So yeah, I think that'll probably be the drama one that wins. That'll be yeah, that'll yeah. be the one. Um, yeah, my God, just so, so yeah, like you said, just so powerful, um, and just like, God, yeah, just like so <laughs> moving, dude. Yeah, like I was gonna say it was moving. Um, and like they're so good to, and like they're so good together. They're two actors who I ne- wouldn't have necessarily put right together, especially right. not in a kind of romantic yeah not not i wouldn't have put those two in a love story with each other yeah it was it was very very um strategically just put together man um from the beginning of it to like the episode starts where it's like oh like you know like oh shit like we're with the regular cast of characters and then it's just like nope (laughs) nope we're gonna 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 talk with this guy yeah so we were watching um so if you watch HBO and after the shows, it's the, you know, roundtable talks or whatever or interviews with the cast about this specific episode. Mm-hmm. Me and Dylan watch those after new episodes of stuff that's just now coming out. Um, so we watched the, you know, interviews after this most recent episode of The Last of Us and the creator who also was the creator of the game, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, Neil Druckmann. Yes. Yeah, he is co-creator of the show. He created the game. Yeah, so he says um, if there's something that does have value from the game that we haven't really like highlighted in the game, but we yeah. can in the show, we'll deviate. Yeah, and is it better than the game? I yeah. think it was, the, was just the question. Exactly. And so he was pretty much like, this episode was something where we were like, we can deviate like totally from what you knew in the game. Um, and... I just think somebody who, you know, I consider myself a gamer, although I primarily play sports games, like to be able to take a character that was just like mentioned in a game yeah, and bring him fully to life in an episode of television and quite frankly, probably make the best episode of television in one year with this conceptualized idea of a character that was just mentioned not even like physically there in the game yeah that's brilliant in my opinion oh um, yeah and it's and very th- similar to like what they did with rogue one yeah and then they like make it relevant uh you know as far as just the relationship and how they how they ultimately just found each other like yeah and in, in in the situation um because that's the other I thing too that, that really i mentioned cool. of like when i was gonna say like you know how i wouldn't have put 
Nick Offerman and Murray Bartlett together as romantic partners. Yeah. Before this pandemic happened, before this apocalypse, Bill and Frank most like <clears throat> most likely would not have made a couple. Right. Right. It was right. this event that brought them together. Yeah. And you know, I think it's I I did read an interesting thing in the New York Times where they were talking about how I didn't realize this. So on IMDb, if you go and look at the episodes of The Last of Us, first two episodes have the first episode I think is like a nine point three, which is an insane score. Yeah. Second episode is nine point two. Third episode, which I think should have at least a nine point five, mm-hmm. at least, has a seven point nine right now. Really? Because a lo- apparently, and I was reading this in the Times, a lot of ultra like right wing gamers or I don't know if just gamers or just right wing ultra right wing people who have IMDb accounts are giving it one star ratings and fucking up it's mm. so there's like a little bit of ones and it's a bunch of tens you know, and a bunch of nines and and that's that's an interesting dialogue to open up because it's more or less like I was to a game I don't I don't know when the last was you know originally came out but let's just ten say, years ago yeah ten years ago right so I was, I'm not going to lie to you, I was a little bit interested in seeing how people would react to it because oh yeah, my original thought was like, oh, okay, if they're going to go this route, like with him having a partner and like forming well, this. Because he ro- does in the game. He, he does. He, he does. says, my par- like Frank is known that Bill had a partner, not business partner. Right. He had a partner, a life partner right. who was named Frank. Right. So and Bill so, has always been a gay character. Right. And I think that that's the thing is you have, if you have the ability to say this was validated beforehand, yeah. this isn't anything that we're just trying to, you know, get something made through HBO or like make something that's just like, the the in in yeah because it's everyone in thinks now like whatever. oh ev- there's like this woke message that has to be right. like drained and everything yeah and that was what the article was actually talking about because a lot of like and I know a lot of conservative people who feel this way that like that a lot of their values are not being represented in popular culture and one of the things that they were talking about with the Last of Us that this article was talking about was how Bill basically is like everything that a right wing person is super anti government. Yep. Uh, very much against how the government is controlling a pandemic and yep. telling us, like, interfering with our personal yep. lives and, you know, using weapons not only to protect myself, but protect those I love. Yep. So a lot of right wing values are very much a part of Bill right. in this episode yeah. and the show as yeah. a whole. Yeah. Uh, somebody even said that, like, you know, zombie fiction is like the most conservative fiction of all because it has all of these characteristics. The only problem, <laughs> apparently, <laughs> is that the person, the man, uh, the man who is defending his family or defending those he loves is defending another man that he also loves. So, like, if you removed, if you removed that element. Then it's acceptable. Then it's acceptable. And, like, then it's OK. But, like, you just have a problem with the fact that it's just a, like, it's so fucking beyond idiotic and just simple. Um Again. If it wasn't, if there wasn't Ah. something there where I could say, no, it's, it's clearly left open to interpretation of who Frank is and who Bill is as a character. Yeah. Then if I'm the creator of whatever piece of art, whether that's a fucking musical, whether that's a TV show, whether it's whatever based off the last of us, I have free reign to make whatever it is I'm going to make based off of that. But I feel like if the creator himself is the one who said, no, Bill had a partner that was a man who was his lover as like, not business partner. Like this was his romantic loving partner. Like, he, yeah, this was his spouse. Then I think we as human beings should be able to be okay with that. Yeah, and, and uh, I hate I hate to break it. I hate yeah. to break it to you folks, but uh, there are gay couples in the world. There are, and and it's millions. And, and that's the thing is, like you, we as artists, you know, I think we definitely have a responsibility of being, of being cognizant of other people's perceptions of who they are. Yeah. So, I think that 
we do live in a, a lot more open and accepting world. And we, we as people just need to be able to learn that art isn't going to be that same closed off box that we're used to it being where it's, you know, this toxic masculine culture filled with, you know, guys doing whatever they want to do and getting the girl at the end of the day. Like that's, that's just not the only thing that yeah is, you know, present in the world. So, yeah. And listen, if the only uh, love story that you're interested in is uh, a white guy and a white girl having a love affair, um, don't worry, you'll still have plenty of options. Yeah. But also, uh, you know, there are other stories that are just as important. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, it's it's unfortunate that there are these people who can't look over that fact. But uh, from the majority that I'm seeing, uh, everyone is agreeing that uh, the fact that these two people, these two men are able to form a love and share a life together also, they're middle aged. They are, which is a, a very specific type of love to develop. Like mm-hmm. when you're when you're fully into in knowing your who 40s, you are. Yeah, yeah. You're fully a formed person. Um, you've had a life up to this point. Um, and also the fact that they were able to find love in the midst of a chaotic world. Yeah, I think you should take away the fact that like there is always going to be hope. Yes, and that you will always yes that life doesn't. And as long as there are people, good things can happen. Yeah. And they might not always happen, but they can happen. Yeah. And that's the great. That's what should be the message. And thankfully, that's what most people uh, took away from this episode, as I, I did as well. Yes. Yeah, I did as well. And I think that that's the overall greater message of what the creators were after and yeah. why it's it's as successful as, of a show as it's been. Yeah. Far. And I'll also say this, too. I think a lot of people um, felt like this was a very sad episode. And mm-hmm. I could, you could Rightfully put it as sad. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but however, I would also argue that Bill and Frank's spoiler, Bill and Frank's was not a tragedy. I mean, I don't know, man, if you don't find beauty in that, then you're just fucking dead inside. And, yep. uh, I'm not a big Dr. Oz guy. Okay. And I know you might wonder where I'm going with this, but bear with me. I am <laughs> I'm not a big Dr. Oz guy, but. I was watching What Happens Live with Andy Cohen a couple years ago, and he was on there. It was about if you're lonely, like, um, what's the best thing you can do if you're, like, lonely or you're depressed or you deal with anxiety, like, you just, you know, want to just kind of, like, stay isolated, like, you're just an introverted person. Like, what's the best way to kind of go about that? And he says, I think the number one thing that anybody who's dealing with anxiety depression, anything is company. Yep. Just go out and do something. It doesn't even have to be with anybody. Just put yourself out there with people because when you're out there with people, you feel like you're in an environment and that you have a community around you and that you're not alone because your mind just automatically assumes that you're, you know, in this closed off space, the more you're isolated by yourself. So if you put yourself out there just going to the mall, just going, walking around, riding the subway every day, you know, just being around people and the more people you're around, you most likely eventually will probably bump into somebody who will, you know, start a conversation with you. And then there you go. You have a social like connection that you've made yeah. by just being out there. So I say that tying it back to the Last of Us episode that we all – or in search of of some sort of company, whether we want to admit it or not. And that company could be the company that we don't understand, and we're afraid to admit it. One of the core messages is like, you know, love is the thing that, like, gets people through these things. Yeah, love and the company and support of another is what gets you through whatever, you know, trial, tribulation, or hole you're stuck or found in. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that... uh, that's a that's a pretty positive note to to end this episode on. If I, I think to. so, and uh, yeah, it's, thankfully our wine does not have uh, pills that can kill a horse. Does so, not. Uh, yeah, that feels like a good feels like a good place to put the pin in. Yep. So, till next time. That's a wrap. <laughs>